Hello, I'm JJ Joaquin, and welcome to Philosophy and What Matters, where we discuss things that matter from a philosophical point of view. And with me today is Hazel P. Biana, and we will explore the philosophy of race. Now, people are often grouped in terms of their race and ethnicity. For example, people are classified as being of European, African, and Asian descent, since they exhibit features typical of Europeans, Africans, and Asians, respectively. This way of classifying people, however, invites metaphysical and ethical questions. On the metaphysics side, we may ask whether race and ethnicity are real categories out there in the world, or whether they are categories that we ourselves have merely constructed. On the ethics side, we may wonder whether the oppressions that racial distinctions bring about could ever be morally justified. Now, joining us to discuss the philosophy of race and why it matters, we have Lucius E. Outlaw Jr., W. Alton Jones Professor of Philosophy at Vanderbilt University, the author of On Race and Philosophy, and one of the recognized pioneers of African philosophy. Hello, Professor Outlaw. Welcome to Philosophy and What Matters. Hello, Professor JJ and uh, <laughs> Sister Hazel. Thank you both for uh, taking time out to engage this old man. I hope that I will not disappoint you. <laughs> okay, so before getting into our topic, uh, let's first discuss your philosophical background. What led you mm -hmm. to get into philosophy and pursue a career in academic philosophy? Yeah, interesting question. So, I mean, a lot of this is actually in the preface to uh, philo on, on race and philosophy. So I had been, was born and raised in one of the states in the United States that is, has a reputation of being one of the most uh, pernicious of the states, uh, racially pernicious states in terms of white racial supremacy in the country, but with other consequences being one of the poorest states, even though a substantial number of people in the state are persons of African descent. It is also one of the poorest and most backward states in terms of all of the normal way in which you would measure human well-being in the United States in general. And growing up in this segregated town, Starkville, Mississippi, uh, one of the things that just never made sense to me was racial segregation. I just couldn't make sense out of why it made sense. Uh, in part because in school we were studying uh, United States civics and supposedly what the nation was founded on and what it was about. I was also, you know, raised in a what we call now a Black Baptist church. My father was actually the janitor of the largest white Baptist church in that town, and I started working there when I was like nine years old. So the notion that you know, you had black people in one church and white people in another church worshiping God on Sunday, but in segregated settings just never made any sense. I couldn't understand why that made sense if God had created all of us, why we had these restrictions that separated everybody. And the invidious ways in which, you know, Negro people were being characterized by, you know, white anti-black racism, as we now call it, just never made any sense to them. Mm -hmm. So when I went off to university, at Fisk University in Nashville, Tennessee, I had gone primarily, I was planning on studying to become a minister, you know, an educated minister. I had sort of started that when I was a kid in high school. And I started taking philosophy classes, and I thought then that I was reading people who were working at making sense of things. Mm -hmm. right? that, being reasonable and highlighting human rationality and working out the terms of human rationality and et cetera, et cetera. I was like, oh, here are people who are making sense of making sense. I want to do this. The other thing was I was at this institution, Fisk University, that was among the premier institutions serving historically black students. Mm -hmm. And a significant number of faculty lived around the university. They cared about students. It was a small residential place, very demanding academically. And I came to a realization that a lot of the people working 
as faculty didn't seem to be doing it as a job, but they were doing it as a way of life. That is to say, they were faculty members, they lived on the campus, they were engaged with students and campus life all kinds of ways. And I just looked at this and said, this is not just a job, it's a way of life. Mm -hmm. And it was very engaging intellectually and emotionally otherwise. And I just said, man, uh, I, want, I want to have this kind of life. And I decided I want to become an, an academic, to become a fundamental, to become a teacher. I didn't, I had no idea of becoming a scholar. Mm -hmm. I really wanted to be a teacher. Uh, the scholarship came later, but it was never my principal focus. It still is not my principal focus. Uh, teaching has always been my principal focus. And how could I help young people learn to make sense in thinking and reasoning and living in accord with them? So who were your uh, heroes in philosophy, so to speak? Who are your influences, your main influences? Well, that's interesting. I mean, you know, when I was an undergrad, I, I didn't really have any main philosophical influence. That is to say, I had no favorite philosophers. Um, I mean, a number of the canonical philosophers I simply didn't like. I mean, I hated <laughs> Aristotle. Uh, Understandable. Yeah I, read <laughs> yeah, I mean, I read Thomas Aquinas. I didn't like, I mean, so I didn't, <laughs> I had no favorite philosophers when I was as an undergrad. You know, I studied philosophy, but I had no favorite. There were no figures who were particularly influential at all. I studied them, did what I needed to do to accumulate what I needed to accumulate to move through the discipline to the next level into graduate school. And it was when I got into graduate school that uh, a couple of things happened. One is uh, one of the members of my cohort group uh, had said to me one day, hey, uh, why don't we come go down why don't you come go with me down to Boston University to hear this lecture? And I'm like, oh, okay. I didn't know who it was. Mm -hmm. And I trusted him. So we went down and we go to the, hear this lecture and it's in a big lecture hall and it's standing room only. Mm -hmm. And there's a sort of, you know, rather diminutive, not, not diminutive, but rather short, you know, uh, un- you know, there was nothing distinguishing about the way this person looked physically that would you know, make him stand out given this lecture, but it was really intellectually engaging. I was like, who the hell is this? Mm -hmm. And I listened, and when I left there, I was like, man, I gotta read more. What has, has he written stuff? He said, oh yeah, there's his book. Mm -hmm. And there's this book called One Dimensional Man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I went and found this book and started reading, and it was, of course, Herbert Marcuse. <laughs> and I started reading this book, and you know, I had had it as a graduate student. I had a seminar on Hegel's phenomenology, and so I had, it was taught by Jacques Domenio of Domenio out of Louvain, which is the first, you know, really ultra. I mean, a first-rate seminar. I mean, it was really fantastic, and so I could. I had already learned the kind of way of how to follow the, the Hegelian, the rhythm of a Hegelian dialectical thinking. Mm -hmm. And so reading Marcuse was not very challenging in that respect. I mean, I, I, I knew how to, I knew how to get in step and dance with the way in which he was thinking because I had already been studying Hegel. But then I discovered like, wait a minute, he was part of a group of thinkers. There was some other, he had a posse. There was some other people. Then I started <laughs> searching for the other people. Who were the other people in the group? Well, it was Horkheim and Adorno. And I started getting their books and reading. And that became really uh, influential. Now, another influence was not so much persons, but a movement. So while I was an undergraduate at Fisk, there was an emergence just before my senior year of what became known as the Black Power Movement. So my senior year, the upsurge of that Black Power Movement was present on the campus in a lot of different kinds of ways that were very, very influential mm -hmm. and started to change my life in ways that I tried to resist early on, but couldn't. And by the time I got to graduate school, a couple of things happened again. Um, 
that was a lecture at the university about a person I didn't know anything about. And I went with a woman I was dating, who's now my wife of 50, 51 years. Nah. We, went to, we went to this lecture, and this guy gave this provocative lecture. It was so intriguing. And of course, there was a person selling a couple of his books. And one of the books was a really thick book, but the title was absolutely riveting, because I had never seen it mm. before as a title of a book. And it was called The Crisis of the Negro Intellectual. Mm -hmm. And it was a book by Hal Cruz. And it was Cruz who was lecturing. Mm -hmm. And so as I got that book and began to read it, and that book was really transformative. And one of the things was the notion of a Black intellectual. I mean, the putting of those two together, mm -hmm. I had never remembered seeing those two terms come together and forge a certain kind of concept of a black intellectual, but coming through the black power period of cultural renaissance, there were a lot of calls for thinking black. Mm -hmm. And if you're in that kind of maelstrom, it begins to affect you in ways you're not even noticing. And you know, then there were pan strains of pan-Africanism being raised and people start talking about previous historical moments of the emergence of Black nationalism and Pan-Africanism and thinking Black. And I was like, well, wait a minute, what the hell does this mean? Because mm. when I was a kid, if somebody called you Black, you would fight them because it was a derogatory notion. Mm. So here was a historical moment at which the negative was being transformed into a positive. Well, that just required a certain kind of inversion of thinking that was initially very difficult and psychologically destabilizing but as you had to live your way through it on a university campus and the political turmoil and getting in sync with certain political currents and stuff. And by the time I'm in graduate school and then I'm seeing the crisis of the Negro intellectual, well, wait a minute, there's something about being Negro different from being properly black and what is that? Mm -hmm. I was into a whole nother sphere of having to rethink in ways that I had never been challenged to rethink in actual philosophy class. I mean, one of the things I'd point out is that from my undergraduate years all the way through my graduate studies, I never, I never had a text in a class or seminar that was written by a black person ever, mm -hmm. ever. Okay, so, so it, all of that. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, it's, it's all right. And so, those formative periods of this eruption of the call for black power and black thinking and on campuses, there was a lot of demonstrations for calling for more black faculty and black studies programs. And I was actually tapped by the university to develop a black studies program. So I had to start thinking about this early on. And then actually in December, of, I went to graduate school in the fall of 67. Mm -hmm. And in December of 1968, I'm in Boston and I used to go over to Harvard Square a lot. I had friends who were at Harvard Law School and et cetera, and I would go hang out with them, but I would also go over and shop for in some of the you know, world famous bookstores in and around Harvard University and Harvard Square. And I went to this particular bookstore one evening and I noticed over on a rack, there was a new journal I had never heard on before. And it had this black and white cover. Mm -hmm. And the name of the journal was The Black Scholar. Mm -hmm. And again, those two words, black and scholar, Negro intellectual. And so all of a sudden these terms were calling to mind something I had never thought about in quite that way, except at certain periods during, during the, my senior year at Fisk. And so this was beginning to really really have an impact on me. And I began to think about, if you will, knowledge being produced by an inter interest of black folk. And here were texts and things that were, that were being devoted to that kind of knowledge production effort. And so uh, I literally uh, got bitten by those bugs during those years. Now there were various people who were influential in that, but it was that larger, that project that became seminal for me. And so when I did my dissertation, it was actually in that area. 
Mm. Now, I was reading people who were very helpful. It was during these graduate years that after that period that I stumbled upon and started reading Peter Berg and Thomas Lockton, The Social Construction of Reality. Mm. It was a discovery. I discovered the writings of Alfred Schutz, mm -hmm. Phenomenology of the Social World, and then his collected papers. And I just started reading everything I could get on Schutz. I was reading Franz Fanon's The Wretched of the Earth, and especially Black Skin, White Mask. Mm -hmm. Du Bois is, uh, you know, the, you know, the uh, souls of Black folk. Mm -hmm. These were all the seminal texts out of which I shaped a dissertation project a hermeneutic of Black consciousness as a way of getting into studies of Black culture. That was my dissertation project. And when I told the chair of the department what I had in mind, he just sort of looked at me and said, okay, you want to be on your own on that one. <laughs> but then I found a professor who, David Rasmussen, who agreed to be my dissertation director, but he didn't, he had no expertise in this area. So I was doing a lot of reading and independent studies he was reading alone, but my dissertation project became very much my project. And I just had to find the stuff to help put it together. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was reading, uh, recently I was reading a book by one of the, uh, Axel Harneth on the you know, philosophy of recognition mm -hmm. book. And, you know, he's doing a lot of work on Hale and then of, of George Herbert Mead and blah, blah, blah. And I'm sitting there sort of chuckling when I read it because for my dissertation, I had discovered reads discussion of development and coming to identity formations in young people and et cetera, et cetera. And I had used Mead in my dissertation, which was defended in the early seventies. And now I read Axel Honneth and about how significant Mead is. And I'm like, no, I figured that out several <laughs> decades ago. <laughs> Okay, uh, so, uh, so I'm seeing uh, uh, your influences here. So you have the Frankfurt School of Horkheimer mm -hmm. and, and of course Marcuse, and you have some Hegel stuff, you know, phenomenology as well, and of course mm -hmm. the, the issues about race. And le let's go to there. Mm -hmm. you, you're, you have written quite extensively on the philosophy of race and ethnicity. So I, I think mm -hmm. this is... Uh, an obvious question, but why did you specialize in this area in the first place? Well, a couple of things. I don't think you'll find anywhere that I ever use the expression philosophy of race. Yes, <laughs> that's why okay. there's a conjunction there. Yeah, I mean, I, I uh -huh. that came up years later, but it's never expression that I ever use mm. called philosophy of race. I never describe myself as a, what is your if somebody asked me well, what are your areas of concentration i never say philosophy of race mm -hmm. it's just not an expression i use because i i don't i find the expression problematic because it's ambiguous in a way uh oh so you can have a philosophy of race well you can but that's not what i was interested in doing i was never trying to develop a philosophy mm -hmm. of race I was certainly trying to explore concepts of raciality, as I put it, philosophically, but I wasn't trying to develop a philosophy of race. Mm -hmm. So when that people started using that in this one, oh, there's an area called philosophy of race, I just sort of went, yeah, well, whatever, but it's not a way in which I think about it. I just I, mean, I don't use it, I don't think about it that way. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't trying to, I wasn't I wasn't trying to specialize. Mm -hmm. As I said, when I was a kid, racial segregation didn't make any sense. So what I spent a lot of my time trying to do was to understand that which did not make sense to me. I wasn't trying to develop a philosophy of race. I was trying to understand race philosophically. Mm -hmm. But then I was, I had a deeper problematic and this is a, an abiding, Du Boisian influence. Du Bois became extraordinarily influential and remains extraordinarily influential in many respects. But in particular, his 1897, The Conservation of Races. Mm. Um, what became and remains an abiding concern for me is how do we understand 
the human species. Now, my way of putting it is, if we accept even provisionally some of the accounts of evolutionary thinkers from anthropology to a number of other disciplines and sciences. Mm -hmm. The account is that Homo sapiens evolved in a large locale that we have long called Africa. Mm -hmm. And the population grew and began to disperse and resettle and disperse and resettle and disperse and resettle. And over tens of thousands of years of dispersing and resettling and adapting, there, have, there came about differing populations. And those populations in, by surviving created modes of life. And pursuing those modes of life in different environments, they evolved culturally and physically. Now, I take that to be indisputable. Now, if one of the things that human beings have to do, I believe, and this is the Bergen Luckman influence, is we don't come into the world pre programmed to survive, let alone to endure and flourish. As I say to students, if you take a newborn human being and put a newborn baby on an island by itself and come back six months, I ask, what will you find? Mm a dead baby. <laughs> if there's anything left, depending on what other animals live on the island. <laughs> yeah. There's no way that <laughs> right. can, right? yep. There's no way that a newborn can survive mm. without the assistance of other human beings. Right. Furthermore, human, our species has the longest period of assisted development of any mammalian species. Mm -hmm. That's it takes a long time, right, to mm -hmm. get a human being developed to the point where we can exercise anything approximating what we might want to call independence. Mm -hmm. it, it, it takes close to a decade and a half or more, depending. Especially for millennials. And, <laughs> even, <laughs> even for pre millennials <laughs> But uh, my point is, and to me, so much of academic philosophy has been perpetrated around a philosophical anthropology mm -hmm. that does not make human sociality central. It's around this notion of individuality and the individual reasoner, the free reasoner individual. I mean, one of the things that I find problematic is that, you know, if you just take Kant's, you know, seminal essay on what is enlightenment, mm -hmm. and he talks about maturation. We've crossed this threshold of maturation into enlightenment, blah, blah, blah. One of the things I find striking is that there is no account of how a human being comes to maturation. We don't do it on our own. Mm -hmm. There is no achievement of maturation without supportive sociality. It can't be done. Mm -hmm. It cannot be done. <clears throat> Excuse me. So how do we account for human sociality? And how do we account for human sociality in an evolutionary perspective for a species that has been dispersed all over planet Earth. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you could have an account of the emergence, the dispersals, the persistence of, the, of Homo sapiens over planet Earth without accounting for populational diversities, mm -hmm. different languages, 
cuisines, cultures, dress, etc., and different phenotypes. Mm-hmm. How, how do you catalog all of human, the human species on Earth, without having to take that into account. And so, you know, you have this question, well, what about categorizations? Are they constructed? Are they out there in the world? My notion is there's no such thing as categorizations out there in the world. <laughs> Categories are not rocks. Uh-huh. Right, right. right. One of the things that human beings have, here's my way of putting it. Human beings in order to survive have no choice but, but to construct. Mm-hmm because we don't come pre-programmed to do anything. What is it that we have in the way of pre-programmed repertoires by virtue of which the exercise of which we will survive and flourish? None, right. none. Right. We've got all kinds of capability, but that has to be nurtured through learning and socialization and nourishment and et cetera like learning a language. We have a capacity for language use, mm-hmm. but which language? It depends on where you're born and to what linguistic community, mm-hmm. what language you learn. You don't come pre-programmed to speak any particular language. You have a capability for language acquisition, which language is contingent. It's not necessary. Okay, so- And so, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so this is the kind of Bergman Lachman idea, right? Berger and Lachman's yes. idea of social construction. Yes. That we are yes. part of a society, we are thrown in a society. It's not, we can't escape society. So, in a way, everything is socially constructed. It's not. It's, That's right. Right. But I mean, you, but your view has yeah, been. As Aristotle, as Aristotle yeah. says, only gods or beasts live outside political communities. Right. Gods and beasts. <laughs> yeah. I like Only gods and beasts. Right, right, right. Yeah, but you're... you're... Man, man is by nature a political animal. Mm-hmm. Your view has been dubbed as thin constructivism by some... Yeah, I read that. That was the first <laughs> time I'd heard that. <laughs> oh, really? So in the... Yeah. Sanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy under race, your view has been classified as thin constructivism. So how, how do you distinguish that from strong constructivism or thick constructivism, perhaps? It's not my notion. <laughs> I, have no, I, I have no idea what the person means. <laughs> you, have to, you have to talk to the person who used that characterization. I have no idea what they mean. You have been categorized. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that the, True. <laughs> I think that the, the picture is so there are extreme social constructivists saying that everything is socially constructed, even natural categories. But I think your view has something to do with it's in the middle of the spectrum of realists as opposed to constructivists. So you're saying that well, look, I, yep. No, I think I think even natural categories are in an important sense constructed. Yeah. Yes. Now Right? I mean, it's not that we are born, right? Mm-hmm. But let's just take the following distinction between Newtonian cosmology and Einsteinian cosmology. Uh, philosophy of science, okay. <laughs> right? Yeah. Now, is there such a thing as the history of science? Mm-hmm. Sure. Sure. I mean, if you read something like an old classic, you know, E.A. Burt's The Metaphysical Foundations of Science. I mean, if you look at Newton versus Einstein, Mm -hmm. why does Newton have a certain kind of view of the cosmos? It's because he has a certain kind of view of God. God is God. You know, God is perfect. The cosmos has to be perfect. Mm -hmm. It's like Aristotle. You know, he's got to work out. Well, what are the cycles of the moon? Well, that's the area. The heavens circles are perfect. The heavens have to move in perfect circles. So by the time he has drawn enough circles to account for the phases of the moon, you know, he's got a, he populated, I don't know how many damn circles <laughs> operating in different, rotating in different ways in order to give the phases of the moon, right? Mm-hmm. Now, Einstein comes along, how do you get a theory of relativity? Mm-hmm. You cannot have a theory of relativity in a Newtonian cosmology of absolute space and time. Right. 
you can't, I mean, right? You have to have a very different metaphysical orientation. Mm -hmm. Relativity compared to the absoluteness of space and time, mm -hmm. right? So my point is, these ways of trying to make sense of the world humans are inventing. Now, within the context of science, we also try to test the inventions through strategies by which we think we can either falsify or verify a con, you know, a construction in some way. Right. And then this gets even more complicated because you've got a whole group of people who are saying, even in the sciences, we have to approach epistemology evolutionarily. So you've got a whole area of evolutionary epistemology that the knowledge production of human beings is conditioned by our evolution as a species. And so even a way in which we say, well, a particular way of viewing the world is natural, is real, has a lot to do with what we mean by real mm -hmm. and the terms by which we think we can resolve challenges to the notion of what real means, et cetera. There is a history to epistemology. Right. It's not like somebody got this right and then there's no further dispute. People are still disputing all kinds of things and realism and anti-realism and this, that, that, and the other. And I'm saying at some point that ought to let us, we ought to just say, you know what? Yeah, <laughs> this is something that we're engaged in socially. Mm. Now, of course the realists wanna say, no, it's gotta be stronger than that. Mm. I'm like, well, okay, good luck with that. <laughs> okay. So where, where, I, where does race come yes, in? Ms. Hazel. Yes, Hazel. Right. Yes, where does where does race uh, come in? How do you connect these concepts to philosoph philosophizing about race? Well, I mean, let's put it this way, right? As I said, if you look at the history of the human species, and you try to write a history of the human species on Earth, you'd have to write us. You'd have to tell a story about emergence dispersal, settlement, <clears throat> dispersal, evolution. I don't think you can tell a story of human beings without telling that complicated story about immersion, dispersion, intermixture, evolution, et cetera, et cetera. So right. you're, you're talking about diaspora? I'm talking about human species on planet Earth. Mm -hmm. Right now the claim is Homo sapiens emerged in Africa and then spread from there over the rest of the planet. And in that spread, people settled in various places for long periods of time and evolved under certain environmental conditions. As a consequence of which, we get different feature sets that are a consequence of population settlement and breeding under certain environmental conditions under which people evolved. Mm -hmm. And so we begin to get physical characteristics that are conditioned by evolution in certain kinds of circumstances over long periods of time. Now, one of the things that I, points I was trying to make is that we don't come pre-wired for getting on in the world, but we have to make sense of the world, right? So one of the ways, one of the most profound tools that humans have evolved for making sense of the world is language. And one of the tools of language use is categorization. Mm. Good, bad, dog, cat, tree, house, etc. Now, are houses by nature? No. Mm. Houses are human inventions. Right. Do dogs and cats did they come into the world wearing a sign that said, I'm a dog, he's a cat? <laughs> okay. No, no. Where did, those, where did those come from? Now, clearly there's regularity that is in to say, dogs mating with dogs produce other dogs, not birds. So there's regularity and one of the ways in which humans try to make sense out of the replication of regularity, that's part of a whole bunch of the metaphysical stuff that people think is, why do dogs only give rise to dogs and not cats? And is there some way we can name this? And by the way, what are we naming since any given dog will die 
what is the name referring to since the dog is growing, aging, and dying, but somehow we still think it is a dog? I mean, you got all, all these metaphors. The only point is that we have to make sense of the world. It's a dynamic, complicated world. We develop strategies for trying to make sense out of the world in order to manage all that dynamic complexity in ways that allow us to survive and flourish. And one of the ways in which we do it is by trying to organize that complexity using the resources of language, like logics of categorization and naming it, et cetera. That that, I take that to simply be a human contingent necessity. We have to try to bring some order to the dynamic complexity. And conventions of naming are one of those socially necessary contingencies of human existence. We have to do it if we're gonna survive, but there's no necessity that we will survive. Our survival is always contingent. So that's why I call them a contingent necessity. We need it if we survive, but our survival is not necessary, but we need it. And so we construct these, we make use of these resources to make sense out of a complex dynamic world in which we live and naming and conventionality and rules and logics is something that we develop to try to make sense out of as part of the ongoing human effort to live in a world that is dynamic and complex and often dangerous and that we have to devise means by which we can survive and manage and try to order the world in some ways up to some extent. So, Professor, and that, and, sorry. And so that means we try to do that regarding different populations, mm -hmm. right? We meet people with different languages, different cuisines, different kinds. We start saying, well, okay, what do they have in common? Okay, let's use a particular term of reference to index all those shared similar features to one term. I try to get my students to understand, you know, and I say, well, you know, it's wrong to be treating people certain ways simply on the basis of the color of their skin. And I say, concepts of race have never ever simply been about skin. Mm -hmm. They're not about skin. Right. They're not about skin. Skin color is a prominent visual feature among other visual features. Mm -hmm. So there's sort of a pragmatic move being made. Okay, people with these skin tones have other characteristics that they more or less have in common. We will refer to them by this prominent feature, skin color, assuming that all the other characteristics also go with that skin color. So when we say black people and white people, we're not talking simply about skin. Mm -hmm. We're talking about people with these skin tones who also share a long list of other characteristics some of which are visible and some of which we take to be internal that we can't even see, temperament, moral character, et cetera, et cetera. And so the skin stuff is simply an index to the, what we take to be the list of distinguishing characteristics of those population groups. Mm -hmm. And I'm, my argument is there's no way to get on in the world without doing that. I mean, example I try to use with my students. If you, if the two of you walked out to a very busy street and you were going to cross the street and let's say, Hazel, you were looking at JJ deeply immersed in a conversation and you're going to cross this busy street and JJ says, hold up, Hazel, don't come, a car is coming. Mm -hmm. Now, here's what I'm virtually guarantee you are not going to do. You're not going to say, well, JJ, what make and model and color is the car? <laughs> <laughs> that would be right. <laughs> that would be right? silly in that circumstance, right? That's right. <laughs> in that, in that moment where her well-being and maybe even her life mm -hmm. could be at issue, she doesn't need to know whether it's a Ford or a Chevrolet, whether it's a <laughs> truck or a car, is it a four-door car or a two-door car? Mm -hmm. None of that is pertinent to avoiding injury or death. Mm -hmm. You just use this generic notion, Hazel, 
don't, a car is coming. Oh, wow, thanks, JJ. That's all she needs to know. Mm -hmm. All the other details for that moment are utterly irrelevant. Mm -hmm. She just needs to know it is one of a kind of thing in the world of which there are many millions. The pertinent thing is there's one that may do her serious injury or death. Mm -hmm. And that's all she needs to know. If she were going to buy it, hey, JJ, come go with me to help me buy a car. And if you were to say, oh, just pick any car, she's going to look at you like you're crazy. <laughs> what do you mean just pick any car? She may have a color preference. Mm -hmm. She may have, inter you know, there are all kinds of preferences going to kick in. But at the moment of crossing the street, she just needs to know something we would call a car. And it could even be a truck. <clears throat> That's not important. A it's vehicle. going to hit her. That is going to hit her, may injure or kill her. That's all she needs to know. Mm -hmm. And at that moment, that is utterly critical for making sense of the world. She doesn't need the rest of the detail. She doesn't need all the distinguishing characteristics of age and model and color, how many doors, does it have a radio? She doesn't need any of that for making a decision <clears throat> that can be the difference between her living and her dying. Now, how does and this, that's what that kind of allows her to do. Yep. So how does this relate to you know, our racial categories? For example, we have to make well, for example, mm -hmm. okay. <clears throat> JJ, do you have siblings? Yes, I do. Do you distinguish your family from other families? Yes, I do. But that means you must have some linguistic tools by which you do that. Yeah, my surname, <laughs> our surname. Okay, <laughs> well, but just think a little bit further. Mm -hmm. Do you take yourself to be obligated to everybody on earth in the way in which you take yourself to be obligated to certain members of your nuclear family? No, so I'm quite, no. attached. Yeah, I'm quite attached to my nuclear family. <laughs> That's right. Right, right. right. Now, and that, that, I would suspect you would regard that attachment as utterly crucial to your well-being. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, think about that across the whole of the human species. Mm. You know, Aristotle and some contemporary thinkers are saying the primary unit of the analysis of human beings it's a family. is a nuclear family. But that's what, not individuals, that nuclear family unit is where we have to start. Mm. And as Aristotle says, as some contemporary people said, we go from the nuclear family expanding into the formation of tribes, which expand into the formation of villages, which expands into the formation later of what we call states. That that evolutionary development is characteristic of our species. Mm. Now, again, I'm saying the way in which I like to think about it is the following. Because the human species spread out over the earth and began to develop in different environments, we ended up with certain degrees of genetic and other diversities. Now, one of the consequences of that is what we then have is these different populations, East Asians, South Asians, various African populations, populations in South America, populations across Europe, indigenous populations of what came to be called North America and South America. We have all these different evolving populations. And I say that is a tremendous asset to the human species. Why do I say that? Diversity. Let's just take one. Hmm? There's a diversity of human beings. That's right. So let's just take one example, sickle cell anemia. Mm -hmm. That's this... a genetic anomaly, correct? Right. Typical of Blacks, I think. Some Black and some Ashkenazi Jewish people. Right, right. All right. Now, if two people marry and produce children, and those two people both carry the defective gene leading to sickle cell anemia, what are the prospects for their children? Um, not good. 
Not good. Mm -hmm. Not good. So now let me ask another question. Is it possible that sickle cell anemia can wipe out the entire human species? No, because it's, no. Uh, yeah. That's right, mm -hmm. because it is localized to certain populations. Right. So here's my point. Because we've had this evolutionary history of the emergence and evolution of different population groups of homo sapiens, the genetic as well as the cultural and other differences have given the species as a whole mm -hmm. tremendous advantages long-term. For the species as a whole. For the species as a whole. Mm -hmm. To use the expression of Mark, if we think about it in terms of our species being, mm -hmm. the diversities are an asset. Right. Because it means there's less likelihood that a genetic anomaly will kill us all would affect will kill us all right right so that's why genetic homogeneity is a tr tremendously bad idea mm -hmm. right so i say let's take the the racial purist the white supremacist racial purist <laughs> i say i say Let's give them what they want. Let's put them away <laughs> on an island to themselves <laughs> and leave them there and come back a hundred years and see what it looked like. We'll come back and find they've got one eye in the middle of their forehead, mm -hmm. three mm -hmm. legs. You know, <laughs> would, in other words, mutation. Racial, yeah, racial <laughs> purists, if they get their way, mm -hmm. will get what they do not want. Mm. That is to say, they will breed themselves out of existence. Yeah, if that... you don't have new genetic information coming into the population group, into the gene pool, then you're going to get all the recessive traits. If the, gene, if the population is too small, you're going to breed to the recessive traits and eventually going to wipe yourself out. Yeah. You need new genetic information coming into the group. That's why intermixture is so utterly crucial to the human species. Yeah, I, I like so the picture. I say, uh, yeah, so... I, say, I like to say what the human species needs is relatively, relatively isolated groups mm -hmm. that intermix. Mm -hmm. We need both things going on all the time to yeah. enhance the viability of the species over time. But we need people in you know, the way in which I put it is to think and say, well, look, Think about different populations of people in different places on the globe living in different environmental conditions. Mm -hmm. They have different challenges that have to be met and resolved, right? Mm -hmm. So if you say to the people in Africa, we're gonna transport you to a place that is cold all the time, you're gonna to have to build a house out of ice. They're like, oh, hell no. <laughs> right? Right, right. But there are people who know how to do that. Mm -hmm. And so as you go to the Eskimo and say, we're going to take you to places that are hot all the time where you're going to have to build some out of grass. They're like, oh, hell no. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> but if you say, well, we've got some people you can call on because they know how to solve the problem of mm -hmm. building a house in a tropical zone out of grass. And you can say to the African, oh, you're going to relocate to a place where it's cold all the time with ice? I got just the people to call on because they've already met that challenge and they know how to solve that challenge and they mm -hmm. can teach you how to do it. Mm -hmm. I'm saying from the point of view of the species as a whole, all these population groups are what I call experiments. Mm -hmm. They are running experiments in survival and evolution. And if we could get those people to keep perfecting those experiments, but sharing what they have gained in running those and perfecting those experiments, the whole species is better off. But if you say we need to get rid of all these distinctions, these groups, and we just need to produce a homogeneous group, I'm saying, okay, you're now setting up a paradigm by which the species can be wiped off the face of the earth. Right. So it's it's like that you're making a evolutionary argument here to survive yes. uh, 
for our species to survive, we need diversity. We need diverse, yes. diverse ethnicities because these differences will, well, the experiences of these diverse people will give us more uh, materials for our survival. Is that the main argument here? Yeah, I mean, and just think about it. I mean, mm. if you, to me, when you read Du Bois in 1897, he was saying, we should conserve the races because each has something to contribute to everybody else mm -hmm. because of the contribution to the storehouse of human civilization. Now, just think of music, uh -huh. right? If you think of musics from around the world being shared with people who can take them up and enjoy them and replicate, or cuisines, you know, I tell people, you get people who want to talk about, well, you know, races don't exist and academics who, you know, oppose the notions of race. I have never met an academic like that mm -hmm. who wants to live in any place where there's only one restaurant. <laughs> That's a very practical argument there. <laughs> Right? Right. What self respecting what self respecting academic doesn't want to live in some place where they can go to enjoy cuisine from all over the world. The more the more they can say they are cosmopolitan. Mm -hmm. And now my response is you can't be a cosmopolite enjoying the diversity of the world's culture if you don't have people producing diversity in the world's cultures. Mm -hmm. It's not like you can go to the go to the you know, to the enterprise on Star Trek and walk up to the replicator and just say, give me such and such and the replicator makes it. If you want Chinese cuisine, you better have Chinese around. <laughs> if you want Indian food, you gotta have Indian people, right? I mean, how are you gonna enjoy Greek food if there ain't no Greek people cooking Greek food? <laughs> if you wanna be a cosmopolite, you gotta have the stuff that yeah. makes for a rich cosmopolitan life. Now you can't have it. You say, well, no, there ain't no deal. We don't need, we need to get rid of that. You know, everybody, you know, I'm like, okay, fine. How are you going to be a cosmopolite? Yeah, you want to so, live in a one in a town where there's nothing but McDonald's? I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, but uh, here, here's a question. So we're, we're dealing sure. with the, the metaphysics, okay? The metaphysical picture, a big picture of how human civilization would survive. We will survive if we have diverse species. Sorry, diverse classes of people. Okay, but well, I didn't say classes now. Let's be careful. Oh, so, sorry. Uh, I'm just using the term. I'm just using. I shift to the term of population groups. Population groups. I, I like better, better politically neutral term. Okay, so but why is there oppression between races, and how how for does lots that... of reasons. Oh. Yeah, for lots of reasons. Mm -hmm. Right, for lots of reasons. Now, one of them, as I take it, is that. When you have population groups developing in relative isolation from others, and then they encounter others, one of the things is to figure out how you're gonna deal with those who are unlike. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things about within population groups, you build up strategies about which you identify those who are to be regarded positively and those who are not. You know, a simple thing between those who are friends and those who are strangers. So like a nothing unusual about that. Yeah, binary mm -hmm. opposition between he's a friend of mine, he's not a friend of mine, he's from my family, he's not from my family. It's, it's not the kind of thinking that people. Yeah, but perhaps unfamiliarity. Yeah, but now that doesn't necessarily mean you get into invidious binary distinctions, mm -hmm. right? Okay, you know, I'd ask you a question, you know, and you said, yeah, I'm pretty committed to my nuclear family. Here's what I'm here's what I, you and I only met face to face. I'm the fact that you love and favor your nuclear family mm -hmm. has not imposed upon you any requirement to hate other people who are not members of your nuclear family. Nice. The distinction that is being taught to love and support your nuclear family doesn't necessitate hate and destruction of those who are not. In fact, in many ways, we learn there's a certain kind of love we have for those who are nuclear in our family. There are certain kinds of love we have for those who are not members of our family. Mm -hmm. We can be taught that. So what brings on conflict? 
Well, sometimes a conflict, is, I say the conflict is over resources. Mm -hmm. Scarcity. If you've got groups trying to secure what they take themselves to need to survive and reproduce, and they encounter competition from others, and they think that those others will acquire the resources to a degree that would put them at jeopardy, you're gonna have a fruit. Now, what are the resources? The resources can be anything. Mm -hmm. They can be material, they can be cultural, they can be, for example, about females. Mm -hmm. Look at the white supremacist thing about black men and white women having sex. Notice, there is no issue among white supremacists about what white males do with their penis. Mm -hmm. There are no restrictions on where they can stick their penises. Threatened by a white male having intercourse with a non-white woman. Mm -hmm. Why not? Because by the white supremacist logic, it's the white female who is the carrier of the purity of the white race. That is why she must be protected from the injection of impurities from a non-white male. Doesn't matter what a white man does with his penis. What matters is what kind of penis and what kind of semen enters the vagina and the uterus of a white female because she is the locus of the purity of the white race. So she, no non-white male must be allowed to have intercourse with her. That's where the race is threatened. Okay, so all this stuff about miscegenation and lynching and cutting off the genitals of a black man, you think about it, like what the hell is that all about? Mm -hmm. It's about the white female as a character of the purity of the white race, supposedly. Mm -hmm. And how does your positive metaphysics challenge this kind of racism? Well, again, The notion, first of all, is that we are all of the same species. Mm -hmm. Secondly, the species as a aspects for persistence, we have population groups and sharing just about survival. It's about enrichment. Just think of music. Mm -hmm. It's not that you have to hear music from around the world to survive. You don't need to hear music from around the world to survive. But if there are musics from around the world that enhance your experience of being a human being on planet Earth, that's pretty impressive and pretty important. So you want to be able to have that music generated in various places and travel in such ways that you can go and partake of it. You know, it's like you wouldn't want good book stuff only be makes to remain within the borders of the country of the where, where anybody can read who's interested mm -hmm. because of the benefits. I mean, I think to me, the diversity of our species is one of our greatest assets. And at a survival level, it means we have a better prospect from avoiding genetic catastrophe by having possibilities that have slightly different genetic and epigenetic profiles. Not absolutely, we're all the same species, mm -hmm. but the differences do matter. That's why I use the example of single, uh, sickle cell anemia. Yeah. Hazel? Um, thank you for that, uh, Professor. Um, I learned a lot about um, <laughs> about these things. It's the first time I'm actually hearing these things in connection to um, philosophizing about race. 
Um, mm. Let's go to Africana philosophy. So mm-hmm. you're acknowledged, um, you're one of the acknowledged pioneers of Africana philosophy. Could you tell us what this is all about? Sure, sure. It's the, the term Africana is what I have tried to characterize as, as an umbrella concept, right? And what I mean by that, uh, you use the term, you know, Hazel, a while ago, you invoked the notion of a diaspora. Mm-hmm. So the term Africana is intended to talk, to sort of, if you will, get conceptual arms around diasporic conditions, mm-hmm. right? So we can identify diasporas by population groups, Jewish diaspora. African diasporas, Greek, you know, any number of different cases where peoples we identify by points of origin who go spread out and set up locations, but while maintaining linkages and traditions that stretch backwards to what are taken to be sites of origin. And we refer to these as diasporas, okay. Now we then try and go in and say, well, okay, what are the similarities and continuities and what are the different new, the uh, newly emergent creative that have come up in different circumstances? And, you know, it depends, but sometimes you've got long list of similarities and sometimes shortness of similarities and longer list of new creations and adaptations and et cetera. Mm. But that may be enough to still say, oh, this is someone of African descent. Now we're not saying, there's some African essence that everybody shares. No, mm-hmm. there are these linkages of, you know, of, of, you know, there are these these ancestral and genealogical linkages. Those don't necessarily make for the same in terms of cultural linkages, but you know, they may give they may still have some traces that help making for cultural, social, political linkages. But there are also profound differences there. It's just a way of saying, I just want to pick out certain dispersed peoples in the world that have a certain kind of, of, of ancestral linkages to them, and then go in and start going from way up here, 30,000 feet, and saying, oh, those are all people of African descent. Mm-hmm. Keep moving down closer to the ground to ask what's common and what's different. Now, one of the ways in which we can do that is to say, well, there were several hundred years in which folk from Europe who identified themselves as white characterized themselves as different from folk that they characterize as Negro and African and even more invidiously and organized large segments of the world to segregate the populations by notions of raciality. And they did that for 400 years. Another way of putting that is races were in fact socially constructed. You just organize populations in such a way that you segregate them and you have reproduction going on under those segregated conditions. You are in fact producing that which you started out claiming already existed. And you're just reproducing it. Now, there's nothing is pure about it, but I'm saying we created these populations. We set up institutions, segregated institutions, segregated communities, and et cetera, within which there were these breeding populations that reproduced themselves. So in a way, humans created these racial groupings. Mm-hmm. And so part of what I'm trying to do is say there is a way in which we can begin to conceptually organize a view of those populations into some similar shared characteristics and then ask ourselves, particularly for certain periods of history, for people who were characterized as being from Africa were treated in certain ways because they were racialized as being from Africa. How did those people contend with all of that and exist over the world? And there will be some similarities and some differences but it allows us to go ask questions about them like, okay, if you're living under conditions where somebody is enslaving you 
Now here's an example I like to use. Let's say you're a female on a slave plantation. You're raped by a white slave owner or some white male on that plantation. You realize at some point that you're pregnant. Mm -hmm. That there's a fetus developing in your body. Now, as that female who has come to realize she's pregnant, she's got some serious, serious thinking to do. Mm -hmm. Does she abort that fetus? Or does she carry it to turn? If she carries it to turn on the plantation, she knows she would not be able to protect that child from being sold if the master decides to sell it. Let's say she works in the house on the plantation. Let's say the master who has raped her, impregnated her, has a white wife, that white wife notices that this slave woman's stomach is growing, mm -hmm. that she's pregnant. Let's say she's noticed that there are ways in which her husband is interacting with this slave woman that suggests that he may be erotically sexually interested in her. Now, how is this slave, this mistress going to treat the slave woman? Let's say that child is born and is very fair of skin. Mm -hmm. And the slave master's wife sees this child and begins to notice the resemblance between this child and her husband. How does she deal with this black woman? What is this black woman? How does this black woman, let's just stop for a minute. How does this pregnant black woman who knows her pregnancy is a consequence of being raped by this white man, if she decides to carry this child to turn, what questions is she facing literally every day about this developing human being in her womb that she has decided to bring into the world? What questions must she wrestle with about whether and to what extent she can protect this child? And let's say that it might even be the case that as she's pregnant, milk is starting to come into her breast and it's starting to flow she might even be breastfeeding the children that the slave master has fathered with his white wife. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things I like to say is, to me, it's very striking that all that racist white people did to black people, black people have never declared war on white people. Black women working in that house could have decided that they could poison the family they were feeding, mm -hmm. but didn't. They could have decided the way to short circuit this cross-generational institution of enslavement is to kill all the babies so they can't become adult slaveholders. Mm -hmm. But they didn't. They didn't do it. Now I'm saying, is it because they never thought about it? Of course they did. Or is it because they thought about it and came to a decision that punishing babies for the sins of their parents was not an ethically appropriate thing to do? Now, my point is that enslaved impregnated by rape woman had to engage in existential thought daily. How was she going to explain 
to others in the slave community her pregnancy. If she had a slave man who was literally her partner, even if not legally married, how was she going to explain the pregnancy to him? Especially when the baby was born. If she had other children, how would she explain to the other children the difference in the phys physical features of this new baby? Part of the point I try to make in that piece in the Stanford Encyclopedia is Black people under enslavement had to philosophize, mm -hmm. had to. It wasn't an academic exercise. Existence compelled serious thinking compel serious consideration of the meaning and significance of life. If you're on a slave ship stacked like wood cargo under the most miserable of conditions, don't you think there were people who had to consider whether death would be preferred to continued riding in the belly of that ship in those miserable, stinking, horrid conditions? What led those who didn't commit suicide not to commit suicide? I'm saying they had to wrestle with the most fundamental questions regarding living and dying and the meaning of life about their identities as persons, as women, as whatever, day in and day out. Some of that got expressed in song, in dance, in music, you name it. My only point was they had to think. Mm -hmm. They had to think. We don't come pre-programmed in the world to survive. Humans have to think, humans have to construct meaning. Enslaved people had to construct meaningful strategies by which they could endure without being completely broken and destroyed. Okay, so it's had to. So for you, Africana philosophy is really about the way of life of enslaved people during that time of how they had to contend with living, mm -hmm. having to be thoughtful. Again, another way of putting it is, you don't endure without thoughtfulness. Right. No, because I think you, you mentioned about Frederick Douglass, uh, Sojourner mm -hmm. of Truth, uh, mm -hmm. Du Bois in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. No, so what makes them part of Africana philosophy? What makes their work Africana philosophy? That they were persons of African descent wrestling with these questions of what does it mean mm -hmm. to be a Negro or a person of African descent or a slave in these conditions and how do we endure? And if, you know, someone like Frederick Douglass, what does it mean to be free? Mm -hmm. What is justice? Right? They're, they're having to wrestle with these deep existential questions. They're expressing, they're articulating, they're writing, they're talking to other people, they're trying to build institutions, they're trying to sustain this across generations. They have to think. They have to articulate. They gave themselves over to thinking, trying to think seriously, clearly, to articulate it in word, to articulate it in writing, to institutionalize it, to pass it from one generation to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. Mm -hmm. And and in every case, in every case, they never declared war on white people. That's never. An yeah, that's an interesting point. Never. Right? I tell you, if you think about what happened in the United States on 9-11, mm -hmm. you have attacks by terrorist teams and 3,000 people are killed. Mm -hmm. The United States declares war 
and goes to war in two countries thousands of miles away. And here we are, still at war, nearly two decades later. From one incident, well, four incidents on one day in September of 2001. 3,000 deaths. Now, I've got here attached to my computer just some numbers about the slave trade. 12 million people subjected to the slave trade. 12 million. 12 million. 12 million. 12 million, millions who died in transport and enslavement. Millions, over several hundred years, millions more subjected to various forms of impression, oppression, even after the ending of institutionalized enslavement, millions over still another century. And yet, and yet still, black people have never declared war on white people. Now I say, if, as I suspect, a great many citizens of the United States were convinced that after those attacks on 9-11, the, universe, the United States was justified in going to war, that that was a justified war, I think I could make a pretty good case that African peoples on the continent would have been justified in declaring war on European countries. And the United States went to war and then they formed what they call the coalition of the women, willing. They got other nations to join them in going to war in Iraq and Afghanistan. I said, well, okay, imagine that African countries went and got China and India and some other countries to become their coalition partners in going to war against Europe and the United States. I think they would have had a case for a justified war. But notice, what we have was a major movement in the quest for justice grounded on principles of nonviolence and love. So people like Martin Luther King Jr. as well. So I'm saying, look at the look at the two responses. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what Cornell West calls niggerization. Mm -hmm. Premeditated, unjustified, murderous violence visited upon people. 9-11, one day, enslavement of African people, several hundreds of years. Who would be justified in going to war? <laughs> <laughs> but black people did. So I think it is worth asking the question, why not? And I'm not at all prepared to accept this. Well, black folk were afraid they couldn't win. Mm -hmm. the, the black woman preparing food in the house didn't necessarily have to worry about winning. All she had to do was worry about poisoning the whole damn family and killing them. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes. Yeah. laughs> but why didn't she? Mm -hmm. I'm saying that she did not, that those women did not, that those women were willing to breastfeed the babies of white people who were enslaving them should be studied. You wanna talk about ethics? I'm saying there's an ethical case study. Why didn't they? What was it about the cultures that they were able to hang on to, the values they were able to hang on to, that they perpetuated even during enslavement, where they refused to visit upon babies and children, retribution for the sins of their parents. What was the ethical scheme that conditioned their lives such that they refused to do that? 
while so, white people were selling black children. Hazel? Yes, you, you mentioned um, Cornell West uh, and uh, both of you have been at the forefront of Africana philosophy. And you also mentioned um, uh, the women who were working, the black women who were working at the homes of uh, white folk. Um, so what do you think about uh, recent feminist writers uh, such as Bell Hooks, Patricia Hill Collins? Oh, yeah. yeah, are they oh, yeah. are they part of Africa and a philosophy? Oh, hell yes. Oh, hell yes. Oh, yes. I, in fact, I just finished a couple of months ago reading several writings by Bell Hooks and Cornell West. I mean, it was really interesting. The more, actually, the more thoughtful of the two of them and what I was reading was actually Bell Hooks. Mm -hmm. Well, Hazel is Patricia a, Hill Collins. Uh, uh, Hazel, Hazel is a bell hook scholar. Has, no, <laughs> she has oh. some words. Yeah, that. I wrote I wrote my dissertation on uh, hooks, and uh, I've been writing a lot of articles about her recently. Yeah, she she is extraordinarily thoughtful. Uh, she's a committed teacher, mm. um, and she was in many, in many ways. I think you know, like one of the works was Breaking Bread. Mm -hmm. right, which is a powerful notion in and of itself. Uh, the way she talks about relationships, for example, the relationship between, uh, and not erotic relationship, it may be erotic, but relationships of friendship between uh, black men and women who are intellectuals. I mean, exploring that is, is really, really, really thoughtful. But her notion of relations in families and communities, uh, she's very, very thoughtful about this stuff. Uh, and in some ways more so and thinks more deeply about it than Cornell. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, because because I remember you mentioned something about um, how rather than going to war, um, black people, uh, you know, they 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 used love as a weapon in order to overcome these um, oppressions, and I think that was the core of uh, Hook's ideas as well, especially in her trilogy about love and the community. Right. Yes, and she's drawing deeply on traditions within black communities from our own home life in Kentucky uh, and, and, and trying to perpetuate that in her own pedagogical practices. I mean, I think pedagogy is something very serious for Bill Hooks. Mm -hmm. I mean, so, I learned early on in my teaching that teaching is, I learned after the birth of our first son, what love really meant as a parent and that that's very much what is involved in teaching. As a parent, I say, I have never met a parent who wants their children to die before them. That as a parent, you do all kinds of things on behalf of the life and the future of your child, even though you want to die before your child dies. That is, you don't do things for your child only on the condition that you live to see how it all turns out. You do it even if you, even if you know you won't be around, you still do it. And that to me is the epitome of parental love, doing for your child, even at the expense of your own existence, even if you don't ever learn, live to see how it turns out. And that's the way teaching is. You don't really know if you're a university or college teacher, you don't know which of your students is gonna really <laughs> take up what it is you're trying to do with your, in, in, at your very best. Mm -hmm. You don't know in any semester long class whether they're gonna really get it. You don't know what they're gonna do with it, whether it's gonna make a difference in their lives. And in most cases, you will never know. Mm -hmm. You will never know. You don't know if you'll ever know what becomes of your students' lives. But you don't give of your best to your students on the condition that they've got to show you return on your effort by the end of the semester. <laughs> That's not why you do it. Teaching isn't about make sure I get the full return on my effort at the end of the semester. <laughs> Write me a paper to show me you understand. No, a paper is an exercise. It's not about giving a full return on it. This may happen years. I got, a, I got an email message last week from a young lady I had taught at another institution I left the institution 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And she was writing to thank me for having been in a philosophy class. She wasn't performing very well. She was very intimidated. And I had told her to come to my office and talk to me. She did. 
And I talked to her about why she needed to become more self-assured. She needed to speak up in that class. She had something to offer. I want to hear from her. And she's now in a PhD program in Stanford. Wow. Out of the blue, she writes to me and said, Thank you. I just wanted to write, you probably don't <laughs> remember me. I just wanted to write to thank you for that conversation you had with me in your office. I went back and I struggled and I got it and I began to speak up. And then you know what has happened over time and now I'm in a PhD program in STEM. I left that institution more than 20 years ago. I don't even remember when she graduated. I remember the name when I saw it. <laughs> and so here, here, what, 20, maybe 30 years later, she's writing to say it mattered. Did I know she was going to write to me? No. Did I know she was going to get it and end up in Stanford? Hell no. <laughs> I'm saying, but that's, I'm saying, that's the way, I mean, parenting is like that. You don't know. You do it because you care. You don't do it because you want to guarantee that it will work out and you will get the feedback. You will get the return on your effort. And teaching is like that. That's part of why I think I say bell hooks is such, is so much into pedagogy because it is, teaching is a sacred loving process at its best. It's not about the content matter, first of all. It's not about helping other people to become professional. It's not about making clones of yourself through your students. Oh, that's a good advice. I have <laughs> never tried to reach. Yeah. Yeah. Not about making I'm, disciples. <laughs> I have never ever tried to recruit students into becoming philosophy majors. <laughs> I, I don't try to persuade promising students to go to graduate school in philosophy. <laughs> if you decide you want to go to graduate school in philosophy, you want to talk to me about it, fine, we can talk. Yeah. I don't try to persuade them to become majors or to go to graduate school. <laughs> decide what you want to do with your life. If I can be helpful, fine. If you decide I don't ever want to be like that old man, okay, good. You probably have a much better life. <laughs> but yeah, huh? I had to, at a at a meeting of the American Philosophical Association some years ago, I was asked to be one of the commentators on some writings by Patricia Hill Collins. And mm -hmm. it was great to be able to give myself over to reading you know, some of her writings. And I called her, I forget the exact expression I used, but that she was a uh, something like a super uh, intellectual, um, Jiu-Jitsu woman. <laughs> she was kind of jiu-jitsu <laughs> I mean, she is so adept. I mean, her thinking is so mm -hmm. adept and sophisticated. You know, she was like she was like a um, uh, you know a uh, a, a warrior. You know, mm -hmm. a kind of jiu-jitsu warrior in her intellectual combat. Uh, same with Kim Kimberly. Uh, same with Kimberly Crenshaw, right? So her notion, the intersectionality, is now a buzzword in academic circles. Yeah, but, you know, I was writing to someone the other day. Here's one of the curious things about that notion of intersectionality. Mm -hmm. So in the mid 1970s, well, starting in 1977, I was on the faculty at Morgan State University in Baltimore, Maryland, mm. and I was. I had hooked up with a bunch of people who had started what was called the Radical Philosophers Association. Uh -huh. <laughs> and that group met one year, one fall or spring, whatever it was, we met in Baltimore. Now at that time, the members of the Radical Philosophers Association who would come together for meetings um, could all be in a 40 person classroom and there would still be empty seats. Mm -hmm. Now at this meeting in Baltimore in the late 70s, there was a presentation by, there were several women who were prominent in organization at the time, Linda Nichols, um, uh, Iris Marion Young, mm -hmm. um, and a woman named Ann Ferguson. Anne was, was a member of the faculty in philosophy at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Mm -hmm. And at that meeting in Baltimore in the late 70s, Anne presented a paper where she explored what she called the intersection of race and class and gender. 
<laughs> okay. So that was the first time that this idea was presented. That was the first time I heard that is a, so here's a way in which I'm putting this. Mm. That was a person exploring what was called the intersecting of matters like race and class, et cetera. Mm. Anne Ferguson, a white woman in the late 70s, mm -hmm. which was years before I ever heard of a Kimberly Crenshaw talking about intersection. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> so, I mean, there's all this attribution that Kimberly Crenshaw introduced the notion of intersectionality. I don't make a big deal of it. I just say quietly to myself, nah. I heard it before I ever heard of him in the Crenshaw, and it's from Ann Ferguson. <laughs> okay, so, so wait. Yeah, yeah he's just, a... Yeah, just to clarify, so uh, what you're saying is to be classified under Africana philosophy, you have to have uh, African heritage. Am I correct? No. 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 No, I didn't get to that part. If you look carefully at the, at the Stanford Encyclopedia of the article, not even all philosophers of African descent are interested in Africana philosophy. No, that's true. Right. So they may be doing stuff that doesn't even fall under that. Just because they have African descent, that means what they're doing is Africana philosophy. Mm -hmm. So part of what makes for Africana philosophy has to do with what are the thematic foci and issues that are being explored that have to do with people of African descent. Which means then that all of those can be taken up by someone who's not of African descent. Mm -hmm. That's an explicit part of the account that I try and lay out in the Stanford Encyclopedia article. No, I, I, there are people who are, who can, who have contributed to African philosophy who are not of African descent. Mm -hmm. So would you classify Anne Ferguson's work as part of Africana philosophy? No, that wasn't what she was doing. She was part of a group of people, of philosophers, who were particularly trying to draw off of Marx and Marxian legacies mm. to make certain critical interventions. And what she was trying to do was to bring together notions having to do with race and class, because this was a long raging issue. Is it race or is it class? And this has been going on in left circles for many, 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 many decades. Mm -hmm. It's a silly argument. Mm -hmm. And she was trying to say, it's not either race or class. There are matters of race, there are matters of class, and there are matters of gender that need to be brought into the attention, into, brought to attention because these intersect. Mm -hmm. We need to be able to think about how all of these come together or intersect. That's what I'm saying. That in, and hers had to do with a kind of left Marxian inspired critical thinking. Mm -hmm. This it wasn't about Africana philosophy. Okay, so in the in the nineteen seventies here in the Philippines, some philosophers were beginning to think about Filipino philosophy. So this kind of philosophy mm -hmm. highlights a uh, concern about Filipino identity, values, and worldviews. But in your view, what lessons should Filipino philosophy learn from Africana philosophy? Uh, things to avoid. <laughs> okay. First and foremost. Okay. Well, and what I mean by that is, is for example, you know, let's just take Hazel's question. Right? You know, Hazel said, "Oh, so this means you have to be a person of African descent." And then I said, "No, don't don't try and structure it that way because you're going to get into a kind of essentialism." Mm -hmm. that is going to be a moral quagmire. Mm -hmm. And there's no need for it, right? Uh, so there are certain things to avoid. Uh, and that's why I say it's about what kinds of issues have been generated by certain kind of people. So for example, you could say, look, the people we're identified as Filipinos, and then you got to work out who those are and mm -hmm. what makes for being a Filipino person. And again, to me, you don't want to try to draw the criteria too tightly. Mm. And here's where notions, you know, like Wittgenstein talking about family resemblances. You don't need essentialist notions. You can deal with resemblances and similarities, right? <clears throat> and you can say, I've got a list of 10 criteria. D does somebody have to 
have all 10 characteristics? You can say, no. Mm -hmm. Some people have 10, some have eight, some have seven, some have six, some only have two. <laughs> Those two may be pretty salient and they may be salient under certain conditions, but not others, mm -hmm. right? Well, what about mixed people? Sure. Mm -hmm. They may be concerned about characteristics from one context on one hand and characteristics from another on the other. And we should allow plenty of room for that, mm -hmm. right? That you don't try to build essentialist category. That's why, you know, the failure to construct notions of raciality out of biological characteristics alone is just fruit. This is just not gonna work. Mm -hmm. And there's no need for it. You don't need it. And that's why the notions of raciality to me because I think about them in terms of evolutionary history and that history is contingent, never necessary, mm -hmm. then we are always dealing with frequencies of probabilities. Mm -hmm. And contingency. Never, and contingency. Mm -hmm. Always, always contingencies. Always. And so, I would say, don't try to draw the distinguishing characteristics of ability. Don't try to anchor them in something that's gonna give invariant security mm -hmm. to the anchorage of the concept. Because for evolving human beings, there is no such thing as invariant characteristics. We are beings of historical contingency and evolution. That's why for me, I have been spending so much time over the last few years trying to read my way as deeply as I can into notion, into evolutionary theories and stuff. Mm -hmm. So where do you think is Africana philosophy heading? What's the future for Africana philosophy? Well, you know, that question to me is like, you know, people asking Marx uh, to <laughs> give them a specification of what socialism would be like. <laughs> in the future, yes. <laughs> right. right. You think about it, he's saying, look, the conditions of socialism should in some ways involve freedom from capitalism, maximum free freedom that releases the creative capabilities of human beings as human, you know, that's old humanistic marks. So you say, well, okay, socialism will be a set of structural conditions that maximize human freedom and creativity. Mm -hmm. Okay. What would come out of... <laughs> So if you say to me, well, what's going to come up African philosophy in the future? How the hell do I know? <laughs> right? Okay. Very if black awesome. people are if black people are evolving mm -hmm. creative human being, how the hell can I sit here and say today Here's the... what's going to be <laughs> created 50 years from now? Mm -hmm. It's easy to look backwards and, you know, an inventory. Mm -hmm. That's easy. But if you say human beings are adaptive, evolving, creative beings, what will they produce 50 years from now? How the Hell, anybody <laughs> with any sense try to specify what that's going to be, mm -hmm. right? Yes. I mean, just think of all the contingencies. <laughs> right, right, right. So, what's it going to be in the future? Hell, I don't even begin to know. I can't. Okay, that's fair. That's fair enough. <laughs> right. Okay, so uh, <laughs> going back to African philosophy, so. Mm -hmm. You mentioned what not to do, but what mm -hmm. should Filipino philosophers uh, learn from African philosophy? What should we do in building up our Filipino philosophy? Well, you know, again, you know, that's that's not for me to say, right? Depends. I mean, here's what I mean. I, mm. Yeah, I, I'm not trying to I'm not trying to be evasive about this. It's really it's really an ethical matter for me, right? 
if you say, hey, Professor Outlaw, uh, you know, Hayes and I are getting together with a group of other philosophers, we're going to try to figure out what it means somehow to be Philippine, philosophizing as persons Filipino. Mm. Tell us what we should do. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's I'm a not a background of why we're asking these questions. No, yeah. I mean, the person's approach is yeah. appropriate. I'm just trying to tell you about my response to the questions. I understand the questions, mm -hmm. but I'm trying to understand my refusal to answer in certain kinds of ways. Mm -hmm. Right, and the simplest one is, I am not Filipino. <laughs> No, because right. um, we, we try. So why to... would I try and why would I then try to say to you, mm. here's what you should do. Right. I said, here's some things I hope you will avoid doing. <laughs> but you might say, I'm going to do those anyway, because this is what it means to me to be Filipino. Well, mm. what am I going to say? That's a stupid way to be Filipino. I might think, well, it may not be the strategic most of it, but OK, you want to go try that? Okay. Go see how it works out and you may get it, it may work out for you. Right? I mean, so what I'm trying to do is to say these kinds of matters should be wrestled with by those for whom these are the salient issues. Right. You can come to me and say, well, now I've got this particular issue, Professor. What do you think? Do you have any advice? Well, if I have some, I will, but to try and develop an enterprise of Filipino philosophy, Africana philosophy cannot be a blueprint that I hand you because so much of that is internal yeah. to those of us who think of ourselves as being of African descent. And there's no unanimity even among us. So part of it is working out in concert with others what that might, what the framework might be that will allow for maximum participation by people who have sometimes greater or lesser differing notions of what that means. And it's gonna be a challenge, right? Not all people who identify, identified as Filipino will think the same way about those identities and meanings and therefore what the project should be about. Right. And so there's gonna to have to be a lot of working out, I hopefully as democratically and peacefully as possible that you do that. I mean, one of the things for a lot of the uh, young uh, black, not so young anymore, black philosophers, when, when a bunch of us got started working on this, you know, 40 years or more ago, some of us were basically made a pact with one another. <laughs> and that pact was that we were going to do our very, very best not to get into fratricidal professional competition with one another. <laughs> right? And how so did for it example, work out? It has worked out fine. So for <laughs> example, in the 1970s, the late 1970s, I was at a, a research center in Philadelphia on a postdoc. Uh, Leonard came through and I told him about it and he applied and I said, hey, now you should apply for it. And he applied and got one of the postdocs and he came in the second half of the year that I was there. Mm -hmm. And so we were spending a lot of time together. And it, on the postdoc, I was, I was immersing myself in trying to read and think about and start to write about more about the Frankfurt School writing. Mm -hmm. Before going there, I had been working with someone else. We had been trying to figure out how to put together an anthology on black philosophy. That's what we called it at the time. Mm. And Leonard was part of a young cohort of young African-American philosophers coming in, taking up this black philosophy, you know, mantle, trying to figure out what, what the hell we meant and how we could make something out of it. And so he came to the research center on a postdoc where I was. <clears throat> And so he and I were talking and he was interested in trying to do a book on black philosophy also. Mm -hmm. So, and we became roommates. I had an apartment in a house in a section of Philadelphia. He needed a place to stay. Uh, I was there alone. My wife had been there in the summer when she'd gone, but come back to Nashville where we live with our son. And so I had this extra room. So I said, hey, why don't you just come share the, 
share this apartment with me because there's an extra bedroom you can have it. So we lived together for a portion of a year. Mm -hmm. And part of what we did during that time together was, was to, I said, well, look, Lena, you want to work on a book on black philosophy. I had started working on that. Right now, I'm working on Frankfurt School because I'm particularly interested in social and political philosophy. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, why don't we divide the labor? You do the book on, on Black philosophy. I'm going to keep doing the social and political. Let's not compete. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, here are all the files of stuff I have on what I have been doing with somebody else to try to work on a book. If you can use anything, you take it. I won't do that. I won't work on that. Mm -hmm. You become the historian of Black philosophy. I'm going to work on social and political philosophy. And let's not compete. Mm -hmm. And let's not get into any fratricidal backstabbing with one another competing with them. And we did that with several other guys, Howard McGarry and Bernie Boxill and some others. And so we did. We, 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 we didn't get into who's, who's the top Black philosopher in the United States. Mm -hmm. We just have never played that game. Mm -hmm. we were very deliberate and saying to one another we will help each other but we're not going to compete with each other and as young people started coming in we reached out and tried to help all those that we could if they wanted our help including black women and whatever otherwise just stay out of the way mm -hmm. and that was and, and we did that in part because we were looking at other disciplines where there was some real serious fratricide going on. Mm -hmm. And I just said, I don't want to be a part of that. Hey guys, let's not do that. They're like, okay. And it, we agree not, not to do that. And that has prevailed across now nearly 50 years. And we don't always agree about everything. Mm -hmm. So given that, um, what's your advice to those who want to get into professional philosophy? Do you have any tips? Well, I think, you know, if you want to get into professional philosophy, I think one of the first things is to try and be as clear as you can about who you are mm -hmm. and what you are after, number one. The other I would say is to be very, very clear about from whence you come. Now, what I mean by that is, as, you know, JJ and I had a, you know, an exchange earlier about relationship family. Mm -hmm. I think that is very, very important because professional academic life can be very damaging on family relations. Mm -hmm. That if you decide you want to be a very successful professional academic philosophy, philosopher, depending on your notion of what constitutes success, you may not ever have an ongoing relationship with another person <laughs> and possibly no children. Mm -hmm. Because what it will take, depending on the institutional context, what the requirements are for success. For example, if you're someplace <clears throat> at one of the top research universities, you must publish only in certain journals. Mm -hmm. You must do certain number of books only by certain publishers, et cetera, et cetera. What you will have to do in terms of governing your night to meet those criteria may call for some very, very strenuous sacrifices. Mm -hmm. And so you have to decide who are you? What kind of life do you want to have? And at what cost? And at least for me, if the costs are too high, 
you must be willing to walk away from them if need be. Okay, but, but there just... are others. There are others who are prepared to pay the price. Mm. You know, women who I mean, I I've had colleagues who are very, very prolific book writers and are childless mm. and are deeply, deeply, painfully regretful of the foregoing of having children. You know, and I say, my wife and I have two sons. You know, now one of my things is one plus one equals 12. <laughs> <clears throat> you have how do you get one, <laughs> one plus one equals 12? 12 grandchildren? <laughs> no. So my wife and I, my wife and I have three sons. Mm -hmm. The three sons are married. So that's three daughters-in-law. That makes for six. Mm -hmm. Two of the sons and their wives have two children each. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> so that's three sons, three daughters-in-law, six, four grandchildren makes for 10. And me and my wife. So our getting together and marry and producing three sons has led to a family, sure. nuclear family of 12. <laughs> would, you say, would you say that your career is worth it? My career is what? Worth it? Your academic career? Oh, yeah, because I, uh, the, I made the family first. Mm. But I had to learn that. I didn't start out that way. I actually started out intending on becoming very prominent and the marriage didn't matter to me. Mm -hmm. It was only, I ended up actually doing that postdoc year. I began to have some severe anxiety crises. Mm -hmm. And all of what got me through was the love of my wife and our baby son. And that was when I realized they were more important to me than professional success. Now, I still had some professional success, but one of the ways I put it is, of my three sons, neither, neither of my sons has ever told me he loved me because of those two books with my name on them, mm -hmm. ever. They have never told me Dad, I love you because you published such and such. Mm. They don't even really know what I've published. I mean, they know <laughs> about the books, but they don't know about what essays I publish or where, or mm. et cetera. I mean, I learned earlier when I was, you know, early on, I would go off somewhere to be invited to give a talk. And there were occasions I would give a talk and at the end I would get applause and sometimes even standing ovation. And I would either drive or get on a plane and come back home and I'd walk in the house and the boys would be there playing around and whatever. And my wife would say, oh, dad's home. It's like, hey dad, hey dad. And go right back to playing. And she'd say, oh, by the way, could you take the trash out? <laughs> <laughs> well, And I'd just been somewhere and had a standing ovation and people asking for my <laughs> autograph. Yes. <laughs> And you'd come in the house and can you take the trash out there? Mm. Now, I've known people for whom, you know, it, here's one thing that was really so I was teaching a course on Mark years ago at another institution. And I was reading this biography. And the biography recounted how Marx was, this is what he had moved from Germany to, to England. Mm -hmm. Marx was, they were in an apartment and Marx was in a, in a bedroom working on one of his books that we think is a prominent work. He was up working on the manuscript. Mm -hmm. And the biographer said, in a back bedroom, one of his children was dying of consumption. Mm -hmm. And I read that and I thought, how the hell are you working on a manuscript and your child is dying? What the hell was so important about that goddamn manuscript? 
and your child is dying. And I just like, okay, no, 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 no. This, this is not that damn serious. And I've got, you know, I, I am sometimes hard on my good friend Cornell West. Mm-hmm. You know, as I say, Cornell has all kinds of ideas about how to remake society. He's been through four failed marriages. Why should anybody listen to him? <laughs> okay. No, I'm serious. Mm. If the family can, is uh, the nucleus of society, right? That's right. Then mm. you can't take care of your own family. Then why, why should we listen? As the young folks say, <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> okay. I'm just saying. <laughs> well, on that so, note. So, Hazel, Hazel, does that get does that get to your question? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no. I, I, yes, I, I think I say, you yeah. know, be be clear about you. Be clear about from whom and from which you come and what it is you want to be about in this world. And if you can keep, if you can stay grounded in terms of to who that you are, in terms of those from whom you, out of whom you came and to whom you are still linked with love and responsibility, you can still have a wonderful professional career. But that love, will help sustain you when the academic stuff is so arid and so politically poisonous Mm -hmm. that you wonder why you're in it. And you can say, well, I I can get my bearings again. I know where love is to be found. Yes. I know from whence I came. Because sometimes you ask yourself, why the hell am I writing? Or why the hell am I doing research, right? At the end of the day. You always ask yourself that. Sure. Okay. So on that note, thanks again, Professor Adlo, for sharing your time with us and your expertise on this one. Uh, This was a terrific interview. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. And thank Hazel for picking me out of the world and wanting (laughs) to spend time with me and for spending so much time with me. I'm honored by it. And I hope it's been worthwhile for you all. Okay. So for you guys, join me again for another episode of Philosophy and What Matters, where we discuss things that matter from a philosophical point of view. Cheers.